In the summer of 1946, a small Army surplus MC-3 Lorraine Moto Crane with an 18-ton maximum capacity arrives in Kennewick, Washington to start work to place footings for homes being constructed in Richmond. These would house the growing workforce being ready to build and operate the nation's largest production facilities for nuclear materials. It was the beginning of a new era and the start of one of the most respected heavy lift equipment companies in the world. With some money that Billy Jane had made and some Neil borrowed, he started buying and selling surplus equipment. The next three years were somewhat successful for Billy and Neil, who now had four children and managed their business out of their garage in Pasco. In 1951, they bought back the old stone Lamsom home and moved their office to the foot of the old green bridge between Pasco and Kennewick. One of the first major jobs was a contract to build four bridges in the Cooley Basin. The job had its problems, and the Lamsons came close to bankruptcy. This trying time gave the Lamsons the opportunity to form philosophies which have carried them for 50 years. Never lose a customer, focus on family, treat your employees well, and watch the overhead. In 1954, Neil got his big break as the Phillips Chemical Plant awarded Lamson his first major rigging contract. Lamson Incorporated, and the company has grown ever since. From 1954 to 1964, Lamson focused on oil and power related jobs in the Northwest and Alaska. They increased the crane inventory from one to over 20. In 1967, the company contracted for a heavy rigging job in Kenai, Alaska. This led to the development of the Lamson Crawler Transporter. While the first crawler was primitive, it was efficient and received worldwide recognition. They were soon developing crawler transporters for service all over the world. Along with the increased demand for the crawler transporter, Lamson was able to secure and develop many rigging jobs that required heavy lifting techniques, special equipment, and skilled personnel. The 60s saw incredible business growth for the Lamsons, but they never lost sight of their focus on customer service. In 1971, the company developed a unique heavy lift system, the Transi Lift. The first prototype had a lifting capacity of 300 tons. It took five years to secure U.S. patents for the system. Today's versions come in several sizes. A 2,000-ton capacity Transi Lift was sold to Hitachi in Japan for the construction of five nuclear plants. Virtually overnight, the Lamson Transi Lift brought worldwide recognition to the Neil F. Lamson Company, with Neil proudly sharing the credit with his son Bill, other family members, and many faithful and talented employees. In 1979, the company continued the momentum by designing and building a four-story building that is now the corporate headquarters, located on the Kennewick side of the Cable Bridge. As good patriots, the Lamsons have three flagpoles proudly flying Old Glory, the Washington State flag, Lamson corporate flag, and flags from the many countries where Lamson is hard at work. The Lamson shop complexes in Kennewick and Big Pasco are the manufacturing centers. Lamson also has offices in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Boise, Houston, Phoenix, Calgary, and Sydney, Australia. With the incredible growth of the company and the worldwide network that the company has established, the Lamsons have had many opportunities to relocate. But with access to the river, good railroad service, and excellent highway system, and plenty of space, they find that truly there's no place like home. Number one is, is home to us. Uh, secondly, we uh, foresaw that we had all of the facilities that you need to go anywhere in the world from here. So why be anyplace else, really? It has everything that any, any industry would want. Waterways, railways, airways, 
good highway system, whatever it takes. We, I could go to work for the Chamber of Commerce because it, it is, and we could see that a long time ago, especially in the type of thing that we were in. Plus, uh, being home was mostly. Our friends were here, and we liked this area, and we had lots of help from lots and lots of people to help us go along in rough times. And Family has always been the foundation of the company. Of the 300 employees, you'll find about 50 fathers, sons, and daughters. But all three of my sisters, Sally, Mary, and Jenny, and, and most of their families have participated a lot in the business, and um, their husbands have been uh, very key ingredients to a lot of our success, and still are. I've had the cooperation of, of good people helping me all my life, good people that would um, stay with me and uh, through thick and thin and, and fight it through. So. Um, Yes, it's been a family-oriented company, and, and I hope to keep it that way, as long as I'm around. Today, the Neil F. Lamson Company is involved in the oil industry worldwide, the space program, the development of the mining industry, and the conversion of nuclear power facilities. There are close to 30 transi lifts in operation around the world. Two 2,600-ton capacity transi lifts, the largest in the world, are working for Lamson at their operation in Australia. A sense of community is evident in everything the Lamsons do, from lending out their corporate facilities for community functions to leadership in building the Tri-Cities Cancer Center and generously supporting every kind of project or event through donations of equipment, manpower, and monetary gifts. It's no wonder that Neil, Billy Jane, and Bill were honored with the Tri-Citians of the Year Award. Hard work, opportunity, and a little bit of luck. And commitment to their family and employees continues to be the guiding force in the daily success of the Lamson Company. Lamson International is a third-generation family-owned and operated heavy lift and heavy haul corporation. Our cranes are used in virtually every industry you can think of where a heavy load needs to be lifted to a high elevation or set at a great distance. Some of our biggest work is with our proprietary product, the Lamson Transi Lift, and we currently have one over in Norway working for one of our customers. We also have one working in uh, Georgia. The big crane behind me, that's the uh, Lamson LTL 3000. It's the largest capacity transi lift that we have built to date. This has a 3,000 U.S. ton capacity and it's equipped with 400 foot of boom and 200 foot of jib. Lamson's has about 385 crawler cranes in our fleet and we store them right here in Kennewick, Washington. We store them at uh, storage yards in Denver, in Houston, Texas, in Phoenix, Arizona, along with our facilities in Canada and our facilities in Australia. To move one of these cranes across the country or to a project site, it takes anywhere from 100 to 150 trucks. Yeah, Lamson employs about 120 people here in Washington State. Things that happen right here in Washington State can make us less or more competitive. We understand the need for regulation within Washington State, but that regulation needs to be streamlined. There is so much red tape that it takes a long time to get anything permitted. And when you're in our industry, you need to be able to react quickly to your customers because that saves them time and money. Early on, my grandparents were very dedicated to, to giving back to the community, and, and that theme has continued on. We help out um, with various organizations, United Way is one of them. When it came time to upgrade the stadium at Kennewick High School, they approached us on um, the possibility of helping with that construction work. And of course, my grandfather and my father are both alumni there. They were more than happy to step up to the plate and provide labor and our equipment for that project. And the result is today we have a beautiful stadium for our high school football teams and our marching bands and our soccer programs to perform in. And the name of the stadium is uh, Neil F. Lampson Stadium. You know, when people need something, whether it's funds, whether it's assistance, whether it's in-kind donation, Lampson's is always there to help out. 
The Tri-City Water Follies hosts the Columbia Cup, which is a hydroplane race that comes to our region every July. It's a big economic driver. We have hundreds and thousands of people come and eat at our restaurants, stay in our hotels, uh, visit our parks, and Lampson has been instrumental in supplying our cranes and our labor for decades to lift the boats in and out of the water, which allows those teams to race here in the Tri-Cities. My grandparents established the business here in Washington State. We're right along the Columbia River, which is an excellent water source for our agriculture here. It's really the lifeblood of this region. We all want clean energy for our families and for future generations. And the Columbia River dams are a perfect example of that. Clean, renewable energy right here in the Pacific Northwest. The family atmosphere here at Lampson, of course, started with the Lampson family, but, but it's carried on into other families. Uh, within the organization and as time has progressed other families have become involved. A lot of the employees that were hired 40 years ago now have kids that work here and when they're right there putting a crane together with their son that adds to it for them so it's a very tight-knit bunch. These people aren't just people we work with every day, they're our friends. It means a lot to me that they believe in our company and many of them I've known since I was a little girl. Good morning, Tri-Cities. It's nine o'clock on Friday, so it's time for Coffee with Carl. I'm Carl Dye from Tridec, and as you saw in the videos, we are honored today to have Kate Lampson from Lampson International as our very special guest. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Carl. How are you? I'm doing great. I I just got to say, both of those videos are so awesome. I, I think, I can't wait to talk to you and, you know, have some questions prepared, but uh, I, I think it's just awesome the the uh, dedication investment in the Tri Cities community that you and your family have made, and and just looking forward to to having a great discussion this morning. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here this morning to represent the family and the family business, and to tell you a little bit more about who we are and what it is that we do. Yeah, totally. Oh, and, and obviously, too, you serve on our board. Appreciate your your you know. I mean, I think your third generation, even on our Tri Deck and Tricknick board, going back over the years. So. You know, long association between our organizations, and uh, yeah, appreciate your your help with our Tridec board too. Um, part of our our deal on Coffee with Carl, we talk about coffee or coffee mugs. So you and I had a, a like a warm up session. We talked a little bit about dogs, and so I bought brought my favorite Star Pugs coffee mug that actually Tracy got for me when I was doing studying for a test that I took. Um, and you know, obviously, it's a it's a it's a riff on Starbucks, but we have four pugs, and they're all rescue pugs. Uh, we love them. And I know last year in our Christmas card, I was kind of like holding two of them. Well, now we got four. I don't know if I can pick all four up this year, but just I <laughs> wanted to kick us off with my Starbucks coffee mug. Oh, I love it. I I think those who know me well know that I'm a real animal lover and a real advocate of the animals as well. And I myself have um, three of my own dogs at home, little Chihuahuas. And so my uh, mug this morning is a tumbler. It was given to me by my friend Miranda Hawkins um, when she was working with the Policy Center, and it says Fur Mama. So uh, <laughs> that's a tribute to my little ones at home. That's awesome. That's you know we we all love our dogs. They're just important part of our lives. <laughs> they are indeed. Well, let's get into it. I you know the thanks for sending those videos over. I think it was really good for all of us just to get some background on on uh, Lampson International and and the story there. So, since your grandparents founded Lampson in 1946, um, and, and I think we heard about a, a few of them, but what do you think are some of the most impactful projects that that the company's been involved with over the years? Wow, you know, there's there's so many to choose from, but I would say here locally, we do a lot of work with the Navy um, where we offload and transport the decommissioned reactor components out to the Hanford site for burial. And um, I've had experience working on that project. It's uh, We do it just about every year. Um, there's a lot involved. It takes weeks and months of planning. Um, the execution is actually two full days out at the port where you work day and night shift. Uh, I've had the experience of working both of those. And it's a real team effort. You know, we've got everything from our engineering and safety department uh, to working with the uh, operating engineers, teamsters and iron workers. And then of course, with our maritime uh, partners, as well as the Hanford site. So it's a really great project for us. Um, and then I think outside of that, one of the most impactful recently, uh, going back to, you know, our proprietary product, the Lampson Transi Lift, 
I think in the video, you had seen some pictures of our friends from Hitachi, and that was the sale of the uh, LTL 2000 back in 1984. And what's significant for me about this is I was so young back then, you know, I really didn't know a lot about it. But in 2009, my father invited me to go to Japan uh, to be there for the negotiation of the sale of the Transy Lift and then the signing ceremony. So I think for me, that's very significant. Uh, the Transy Lift is, you know, here in the Port of Pasco right now. Um, we're hoping that that will go to work in Japan uh, next year. So I'd say those are two significant ones uh, that I've been involved with. Oh, that's great. I think um, I, I was just reminded when I was watching the videos like of of your grandparents and, you know, starting out in 1946, right after the war and uh, the projects that they worked on and kind of like the, the building up of the business. And for some reason, it reminded me of this John Wayne movie called Hell Fighters, which is like one of my favorites because, you know, he he I forget his name of the movie, but it's about Red Adair that, you know, fought oil well fires and had equipment that they'd bring it in, you know, just on a moment's notice when there was a thing to take care of. And, you know, just the way the video flow just kind of reminded me of that. And I mean, anytime I can bring up John Wayne and, you know, make a comparison, I'm just always super excited about it. So, it's well, really I, cool. I don't know if you know this, but uh, my grandfather, both my grandfather and my father are huge fans of John Wayne. I mean, John Wayne was everywhere growing up in our family, the videos, the pictures on the wall, the bronze statues. So, I think that's wonderful. You you share the love of, of John Wayne as well. You can't help it. I think you know of a of an age or of a, certain generations. I think every you know uh, kid thinks of his dad as John Wayne. Uh, you know, I always did, and so it's just I, yeah, <laughs> it's you know it's it's a it's multi generational, I guess for sure. I like it. Um, so in the video, we learned about uh, that your grandparents really built Lampson on these four principles. Some of them were learned the hard way, you know, with, with maybe a tough job uh, early on. But those are never love, lose a customer, focus on family, treat your employees well, and watch your overhead. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, you and your brother and your dad and other family members are carrying that forward? Hey, there's Peter. Perfect timing. This hey, is my brother, yeah. Peter. Pete wants to meet everybody. Hello. How's it going, Peter? Good to see you. Good. I heard you guys are drinking coffee in here. Yeah, drinking coffee, <laughs> talking about John Wayne and dogs. So, you know. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> it's Pete good to I see you. You too. We work together very closely. It's a lot of fun to have him here. So. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, well, good. Hope go ahead. Doing well and staying safe. <laughs> oh, you bet. Thanks a lot, Peter. It's good to see you, man. All right. You, Thanks for you coming too. in, buddy. Yeah, no problem. Good timing. That was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> We're asking a question about the four four uh, principles from your grandparents, and now you can give us examples of how you and Peter and your dad are, are carrying that forward. Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, one of my philosophies is remaining true to the family roots and to what my grandparents started so long ago. You know, their philosophy of, of treat your customers, you know, give your customers the best possible service, treat your people well. And I believe in that philosophy. I feel that if you take care of your people, you, know, you will keep your doors open, you will remain profitable, and you'll keep the business going. And for me, it's not just about setting up, you know, a succession for my brother and I, which are third generation, but the fourth, fifth, sixth, and beyond. I'd like to see our company last into perpetuity and remain one of the heavy lift leaders in the world. That's that's so awesome. I um, think you and I talked about it a little bit. I, I did for sure when I was uh, with Bill, but I used to work for Caterpillar Corporation, and and you know obviously the heavy equipment industry is one that you guys are leaders in, and I used to work in it and. You know, you see that a lot of times like at a dealership or even in companies, construction companies, I used to work in forestry, you see that secession and it's not, it's not easy to manage, but you guys have obviously done a really, really great job of it. And it's, it's so exciting to hear, you know, how you're planning for those uh, future generations within your family and, and even your employees' families, right? Because it, I think, I think that's the kind of the takeaway for us in the Tri-Cities is you guys have made this investment and you're, you're dedicated to our community. A lot of times what happens, I think, especially with family owned businesses as as future generations, if you don't have that succession plan, if you don't have, you know, the kids come up in the business like you guys did, uh, you know, future generations might not be interested in it. And then then they kind of think about selling it. Well, 
you know, when a company gets sold, then you ha then that company might move away, right? I mean, just because somebody else buys your company doesn't mean you're going to stay there and keep on employing people. So that, I mean, that just really proves you guys' dedication to the to the Tri Cities, and 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 it's you know it's hard to do because a lot of times it doesn't work, but you guys are obviously making it work really well, Kate. Well, thank you, and I think part of our success has been, you know, in the video it said. You know, we've had multi generations of father, sons, and daughters um, working with us every day, and that is still true today. And a lot of our success has been the people that have been with us from the very beginning. We have some people that have been with us for over 55 years, people that I grew wow. up in the business with. So, a lot of great experience coming from other family members before me and very seasoned uh, individuals that I get to work with every day. That's so cool. I, you know, since you are third generation, what are some of your earliest memories of of the company? And, you know, probably I'm sure coming with your dad to work and, and, and spending time with your grandparents, but then like company related, what are some of your earliest memories? So honestly, going back to my father, I think um, some of my fondest memories were coming down to the Pasco yard on Saturdays with my dad. He would drive through the yard, check on the equipment, see what was getting ready to load out on Monday, talk to the guys if they were working in the shops. And even though I didn't fully understand how important it was back then and the impact that it had, um, both for the company and for our family, I knew that it was important that he was there. And it was important for the guys to see him there and to really care. Uh, so that, that goes way back. Um, and then I think too, you know, when my grandparents started off with very humble beginnings, they didn't have a lot of money. So they entertained in their home a lot. When they had customers come to town, my grandmother would put on a beautiful spread of a home cooked meal. And in middle school, I remember asking my dad, like, why don't we just take him out to dinner? And he said, honey, these people are on the road all the time. The last thing they want is another hotel, another steakhouse and a steak dinner. And I learned a lot from that. Um, when my parents, you know, started their own family and that transitioned in our family, my sister, Anna Marie and I learned at a very early age how to serve and clear and the value of spending time with these customers at the end of the evening. I still have memories of spending time with our customers uh, from Japan, from Turkey, um, you know, from the UK, all parts of the world. And those people became our friends, not just customers. That, that says so much about, you know, your, your uh, family and your company's business focus, because uh, you know, Bill's exactly right. When <laughs> when you're out on the road for a week or two weeks, the last thing you want is is another one. And and you know, just the the sincerity and the the honesty of saying, you know, come to our house for dinner. Let us let us take care of you. I I mean, what a what a relationship builder for sure. That that that's really amazing. Um. So so speaking of that, how how do you how do you carry on your grandparents and your and you know your parents' legacy, um, while taking on new opportunities, and then and then working on your legacy. I mean, how can you maybe give us some examples of man, maybe how you and Peter are working on, uh, you know, kind of taking those same business philosophies, Kate, and and you know applying it in today's world? Because obviously we know it to a certain degree, it is a different world. It's, we're still people. We still have relationships, but you know now we live in a digital age. We're having this you know remotely instead of in person and. Uh, you know, are, can you give examples of how you apply that same philosophy to, to, you know, today's world? Sure. I think for Peter and I, you know, it's always been a very family oriented business and we try and keep it family oriented. Uh, it's been tradition here to be flexible with our employee schedules, uh, whether you're volunteering at your church or maybe you're coaching little league, as long as you're getting your work done, you're getting your hours and we're very flexible. Uh, especially with, you know, if you have childcare at home or this last year with, you know, kids going into remote learning, we try to work with parents on that as, as best we can, uh, so long as it's not having a negative impact on the organization. So for us, it's definitely keeping that tradition alive. Uh, you know, we try and do a Christmas party every year with the employees and a summer barbecue as well, which are two totally different events. Uh, the summer barbecue is a lot of fun because we involve the families. And it's over at our shop facility in Pasco. So again, just really keeping that that family atmosphere around here alive. Yeah, good. That's uh, I just really appreciate that so much. It's really, <laughs> really cool. Um, so talked a little bit about it in the the videos, but what are the main industries that you guys support? You know, because obviously uh, you think about uh, 
crane and heavy rigging and and we all see different types of cranes on different construction sites but you guys really specialize i i think uh there was one statement in there about you know uh kind of specialize in very heavy lifts that have to be placed very high or maybe be transported while they're lifting but can you talk a little bit about those industries that you guys really specialize in Sure. So an example of that um, specifically to the heavy lift would be like in the oil and gas industry. We do a lot of work with componentry replacements and um, power plant construction. Oftentimes you're you're getting in there, you've got uh, lines to worry about and pipe racks. It's very sensitive. You've got a small footprint to work with and to maneuver within. Uh, so I would say that that is really where we excel, where we have a lot of great experience and one of the selling points for the transi lift because it does have a smaller footprint um, than the majority of the competition out there. Uh, in addition to the oil and gas industry, we do a lot of work in the mining industry, a lot of uh, moving crushers and apron feeders. Um, we do some work in Australia where we're one of the only com companies in the world to do this type of work and the only company to do it with the lamps and crawler transporter and that's moving drag lines. Uh, on mine sites through the Australian Outback. We started doing this work over 20 years ago, and we found that we could move these pieces of equipment in half the time and for half the cost that the mines could do it themselves. So that's been great for us from a heavy haul perspective. Uh, we also just do a lot of work with infrastructure, you know, um, hotels, bridges, new stadium construction, projects like the light rail in the Seattle area. Uh, we also do some wind work in the wind industry. So, you know, erecting uh, some of the wind farms. We've done some storage of componentry here at our facility in Pasco. Uh, and something, you know, we've been involved with for a long time, but doing more of is the maritime services. Uh, with the remanufacture of our uh, Lampson Millennium 4100 and 4600 crawler cranes that can also be ring mounted, we do a lot of uh, dredging work and pile driving with those machines in the marine services sector. Oh, that's awesome. And I think that's something I learned from Bill too, that you guys, you, you know, rent or lease cranes to other companies to operate. You offer, uh, you know, heavy pick and transport services where you manage the whole thing, soup to nuts. And then you also manufacture specific uh, cranes, but, um, you know, and actually doing the work for dredging and, and those type of maritime services, is that, is that growing? Like, are there more, um, is there more potential for jobs out there? And then thinking about, I know it hasn't passed the house yet or the president signed it, but this new infrastructure bill where I know there's dedicated funding to things like improving ports and things like that. Are you guys taking a look at that and, and trying to anticipate where there might be some of that specialized work coming up? Yes, you know, we get um, we get requests from various ports all the time about either, you know, purchasing one of our cranes or renting one of our cranes as assist cranes on the docks. Um, we do have companies that we work with all the time that specialize in the, the pile driving and the dredging. And so in a situation like that, we would either sell them a Millennium crane or we would bare lease it to them so that they're in charge of, of the labor and the rigging and the safety and all of that. We're just housing the crane. So that kind of goes back to, we have many facets of our business. We buy, sell, manufacture, and rent. And so our rental fleet is the crawler cranes. Our proprietary product that we manufacture is the lamps and transi lift, as well as the lamps and crawler transporter. And then we do have a heavy haul component um, with our specialized trailers. Yeah. And when we were getting ready for this, I told you I wouldn't ask any technical questions because I, like I said, you know, like kind of growing up in the heavy uh, equipment industry, I, I'm kind of a geek on this stuff. But I, I will just maybe bring up like your point about the hauling a drag line in, a, in an Australian mine um, and doing it so much quicker and easier. I think I just wanted to bring up like it's a, I think the difference is, is like you can keep the crane in essentially one piece and, and put your crawler transport underneath it and then take it to where it's going, their, their alternative is to literally take it apart and then haul each of the parts on a truck and then put it back together. So I, I just had that picture in my mind. I wanted to share that with the folks watching us today is like, that's a huge difference, right? I mean, you could imagine like your car or something mechanical, you know, taking it all apart, putting it into boxes and then shipping it someplace or just hauling it on a trailer. And that's that's kind of what you guys do and really pioneered that industry with the with the crawler transporters for sure. Yeah, that's a great example, Carl, and thank you. Yeah, and, and while I'm on the thing, and I was just thinking about uh, work, I think some work with NASA, right? Because when I think about, uh, you know, back in the day, the Saturn V rockets that put uh, the man on the moon, 
th NASA actually had something very similar and maybe they kind of picked up your idea of a crawler transporter, but haven't you guys done some work in that sector, like, haul, you know, moving uh, NASA kind of components? I think I saw a picture in the video maybe. Yeah, we've done some work with the aerospace industry in the past, both with our cranes and with our crawler transporters. Uh, they did call upon us not too long ago when they were looking at um, refurbishing or remanufacturing their crawler to move the space shuttle. And so we uh, were one of the companies that that placed a bid on that. Oh, that's cool. But and I, I um, want to bring up too. I think that's the basic thing is like you talked about it a little bit, but you guys with your shop facilities and with your with your crews you have both in Kennewick and at Big Pasco, uh, you know, the the ability for your company to to buy a piece of equipment, tear it down, rebuild it, refurbish it is really unique. And, you know, I think as as um, companies change over time, that's something that everybody used to be able to do. You know, probably when your grandfather started, every company had a really uh, uh, shop that could do a lot of of that type of rebuild work and as things have changed so many companies have gone away from that and it's something that you guys really obviously do very well and it, and it seems to be a really key part of your business so that's a, a unique opportunity i think that you guys have over your competition yeah it really is uh you know we've i think because we started from humble beginnings we learned to you know new build remanufacture we save a lot of scrap you've been through our yard you know we have what we call the bone yard down there uh we hang on to things but you know you might take a trip down to the bone yard and find something you actually need that is still in great shape and you end up using it uh, and with regard to the remanufacturing we're doing right now with those cranes you know it started off as just refurbishing our own rental fleet but our customers started hearing about it. They came out to see how the cranes function and that actually turned into sales of these cranes, yeah. which, you know, the operators are loving them because they're bigger and they have more visibility. They, um, you know, have a faster line pull and they can lift a lot more capacity. There's also safety features built into these cranes. So we're able to work on, on job sites that, you know, traditional uh, crawlers haven't been able to work on in the past. So it's been great for us uh, from sales and marketing and our rental perspective. That's awesome. That's I, I appreciate the boneyard. You know, and Bill gave me the tour. It just it it, and and I'll just point out something else too. I I think it's it is unique because you know as we've, or hopefully coming out of the pandemic now. You know, we all saw these supply chains around the world, um, kind of like stop or collapse or get stretched out. And you know, so many manufacturers, especially, but just in, you know, even things like consumer goods, we've all kind of gone to this just in time inventory situation and and lean manufacturing. But you guys keep the boneyard, you keep items in stock so that you can react quickly if there's a breakdown or if you know somebody needs it so you can have that high level of customer service. You know, you guys have maintained that through the years, but now I think we're gonna see a lot of companies going back to it just because the, the reasons that you guys have done it, like it gives you a better uh, responsiveness to your customer and gives a higher level of customer service is, is things that I think companies are gonna realize. Like it's not all about you know, lean manufacturing and having MBAs look at your inventory and stuff and try to cut down your overhead. It's about really taking care of your customer, which I think is awesome. Yeah, you're 100% correct, Carl. I can't tell you how many times we've gotten calls in the middle of the night where we need a part on site the next day and somebody jumps in the service truck and drives it to, you know, Wyoming or Montana or another part of the country. Uh, we've even had Manitowoc call us in the past because we keep parts <laughs> that they no longer manufacture. So wow. great relationship working with them. And that spans three generations as well. So there is something to be said for uh, hanging on to some of the old. It's well, it's a great example. And I think it's it's that uh, it's the context, right, of, of like we see trends in business and in manufacturing going this way and then something happens and then you'll probably see the trend go the other way. There's really something to be said about the way you guys run your business, just, you know, maintaining this aspect and continuing to grow your business with that approach, which is really refreshing, you know, within all the business things that we think about um, in today's world. Um, how about lamps and blue? Is there significant? I mean, it's such a striking blue color. Is there there a story behind lamps and blue? You know, I get asked that question more often than you would think. Uh, <laughs> it's a really simple answer. It was my father and my grandfather's favorite color. Uh, so they chose blue. We also at the time needed to differentiate ourselves between some of the competition and some of our suppliers. There was, you know, reds and yellows and other shades of blue. So 
It has become known as lamps and blue in the industry. Um, we do have a Pantone for that color. Uh, and the Transy lift is known as big blue in the industry. Ah, uh, perfect. Um, and so you talked a little bit about some of your different locations and, and obviously Lampson is a, is a global business because the industries that you serve are, are very global. Um, but outside of your seven locations in the U S where, where do you guys have, you know, maybe branch locations or, you know, parts uh, warehouse or something, are there other places outside of your seven um, offices that, that you do business out of? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, so in addition to our U.S. operations, we do have um, six offices in Australia and one in Canada um, that comprises the 300 employees that work with us around the world. And then I'm proud to say that in the 75 years that we've been in business, we've worked in over 55 countries during that. Wow. So we literally do work all over the world and we are continuing to do that today. That's really great. I you know, you talked about uh, petroleum mining and, and, you know, obviously with the shifts in businesses that we're talking about, um, do you see some trends within the industries that you serve? Um, I think there was a, a mention of, uh, you know, wind turbines. And so is that, uh, I don't know, a, a part of your business or a growing part of your business, uh, you know, as, as uh, refineries and, and other kind of energy related companies even transition and hopefully you know, we're all um, huge proponents for more nuclear, which I, I think, thinking with the Hanford site, that's where you guys probably, you know, built a lot of your business. And and obviously, I think in their relationship with Hitachi, right, is related to the nuclear business. But but within those industries, do you see some trends emergence? And, you know, maybe with pandemic, it's it's kind of hard to see which, which direction is going to come out. But any directions in the industries you serve, Kate, you see coming up? You know, I mean, there's a lot more talk of, um, you know, I like that there's more talk of nuclear here, especially um, in the Tri-City area. I think there's a lot of good that we can do out there at Hanford and continue that legacy. Um, I will say there's, you know, more talk of, of solar and of um, wind. I, I do feel in hydro, of course, with our wonderful dams here along the yeah. Columbia River. Uh, and we, we do work in that sector too. Uh, I do feel like it, it takes a little bit of everything, right? A little bit of all types of energy to keep us going. And I would say that right now, we'll probably start to see a bit of a downturn uh, in the petrochemical world, just the nature of what's happening there. Um, I've, I've seen a little bit more requests for some wind work um, all over the US, a lot on the, the East Coast. Um, but I would say, you know, it, we remain strong in, in all those sectors. You know, we take the calls and we, we put out the bids and we'll go wherever there's work for us. Yeah. That, that brings up a good point. I mean, obviously, you guys have this 75-year legacy of really leading the industry. But, at, you know, is your reputation one where you do get a lot of inquiries or, you know, people are, are companies are asking you to put in a bid on something? I mean, versus your marketing outreach to companies and, and you know, making sure that you're in contact. I mean, how do you balance that? Or, or, or how, do your, how do your leads for bids come in? Like, is it can you describe that a little bit for us? So that's a great question. And there's definitely a difference between, say, the, the request that we get for the transi lift versus yeah. the rental fleet, the conventional crawler, crawler planes. And the reason being is that there's only a handful of players globally who can do the type of work that we can do. So you see a lot of those companies getting the same bids and we're, we're up against them all the time. Uh, with the crawler cranes, you know, you've got so many different types of fleets out there and different services that are offered. And so that's a little bit more of marketing, marketing those um, in that regard versus the transi lift. You know, it's, it's kind of speaks for itself, right? Anyone who's worked yeah. with transi lift or had it on their job site, they know what it's capable of and they know how different it is from the competition. Whereas the crawler fleet, you know, I would say that we're unique in some ways, especially with the Millennium Cranes, um, but we're very similar in other ways. That's great, great overview. I, um, I when you talk about the specificity or this, you know, specialty of the transi lift, what I didn't realize um, until we had these conversations is that a unique feature of it is that it not only lifts this very, very heavy load, but then it can actually travel. So it, it can pick it up and travel. And I forget, and if this is too technical, totally my bad, but um, how far have you picked something really heavy up and traveled with a transit lift? 
So great question about the maneuverability of the machine. So it can go with the crawler transporters. There's two of them that sit at the base and it can go forward, backwards and sideways in a crab-like configuration while picking and carrying and it can spin 360 degrees. So you truly can yeah. set it down anywhere. It all depends on the radius and the lift height and what you're lifting. So that varies based on what your specific component is at the time. That does change. Gotcha. Yeah, because I, I was struck by that, that you know, think about you know, picking up this uh, you know, very, very heavy object in these industries. Most cranes can pick it up and wherever it can swing and boom in and boom out, that's where it can place it. But having that capability to, to move once you pick it up is, is huge. And that's such a unique feature of the transit lift. And that is, it really is. My grandfather and our head engineer at the time, Walt Trask, were very innovative. And I think that's why we've been so successful is because of the maneuverability of that crane and all that it offers. Yeah, I, I, I could talk about that forever. I'm gonna keep on moving down our questions. <laughs> um, what, what was your favorite project around the, the, all your projects around the world and around the globe? Uh, what, what's some of your favorites, Kate? You talked about being able to go uh, and you know, help negotiate on this last last uh, LTL three thousand with Hitachi, and obviously you've been to Japan. But what are some of your places, favorite places to go that that you've experienced and that you guys do business in? I think uh, for me, it was probably Australia. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, six offices down there. Our home office is in Toronto. It's about an hour and a half north of Sydney. And uh, after college graduation, I had the good fortune of being able to work for the family business in Australia for about two years. And it was oh, wow. great for me just to see how different the organization operates um, and how it's different overall from the safety aspects and their rules and regulations in that country. Um, working with you know, the building trades and the great relationship that we have down there as well as up here in the US. And then really getting out on the mine site and working with our engineers and actually seeing those dragline moves that, that I was talking about earlier. Just a really great overall education. I got to travel to some of our branch offices with our then managing director. I got to see different parts of the country and made friends that I still consider family today. Uh, and uh, many of our staff members have been with us for years and they're, they're still there. So I would say it was Australia. So I had a chance to go there uh, once myself for business and I totally agree. Like, it's just, it's so cool. You know, I, I think, I think the great thing about Australia is it literally is a different country. So it's so exciting to, to go and, and uh, explore and meet people and stuff, but everybody speaks English, which is really cool. Like as long as you can drive, figure out how to drive on the left-hand side of the road, like you're good to go. You know, it's kind of like going to California or something. It's like, Oh, it's all different. And stuff. That took me a little bit to, to get used to, but I uh, just, Beautiful country, incredible people, uh, just a really nice way of life down there. Yeah. Um, let's go on to our, our, our next question. With so many outside influences, uh, you talked a little bit about on the, you know, the video, the kind of like um, uh, government regulations and politics. What's been a major industry change that's impacted lamps in today? And I, I was just thinking of it even with your Australian example is like, do you see a different approach um, in Australia? And I think of those industries you guys serve down there, like, like mining um, and, and other, you know, natural resources based industries. And it's, it's such a big driver in their economy. Do you see a, a difference in, you know, the relationship in between business and government in some of those countries like Australia versus, uh, you know, uh, how we do it here in the U S or even Washington state? I think that it varies uh, quite a bit depending on which country you're in. And like you said, yeah. even here, you know, in the U S uh, I would say our operation runs very similarly down there. Uh, although some of their rules and regulations might be different surrounding, you know, engineering or safety, the way that we conduct the operation, the way that we run the operation down there, our managing director, uh, John Lee and his team do a phenomenal job. You know, they're on the other side of the world and it, it runs, very, very smoothly. Uh, Bill's in touch with uh, John at least once or twice a week, if not more. So they're in constant communication. Uh, but I would say, you know, technology, honestly, I think is at the forefront of our company, everything from the lamps and crawler transporter to the transi lift and 
to the Lamps of Millennium Crane, it was actually our managing director um, at the time, Phil Lunn, who came up with the concept of trying to do the Millennium Crane. And it took years to kind of fine tune that and hone it. Um, and between our engineering department here and there, they perfected it. And we started, you know, testing it out here at our test facility here in Pasco. And it's turned out to be very successful. So I would say that the technology has been uh, a leader in our company and just the opportunity to work in so many different industries and learn from those experiences, have different types of customers, different projects we work on. Everyone we do is different and it's a learning experience. Yeah. I, let's, let's maybe we'll, we'll bring it down to the local community because again, in the video, so many great examples of, of uh, you know, really the investment and the dedication that, that uh, your company and your family have had to our community. But uh, here in the Tri-Cities, obviously your name's really well known from numerous uh, community sponsorships, support and building like Lamps and Field, great example, uh, the Lamps and Pits at the boat races. Uh, but not many people may know of the work that's been done in the Tri-Cities. Uh, can you give us some some examples of maybe like some actual lifting or transporting? You talked about the, the naval nuclear uh, role that you play there, but are there some other big projects in the Tri-Cities that you guys have worked on? And then we'll get into that uh, more of the philanthropy area. Sure. So, you know, going all the way back to the humble beginnings, I know one of our first real jobs was the church's grape juice smokestack. We raised that here right in downtown Kennewick. Uh, we did some work with the dams up and down the Columbia River. Um, I would say, you know, early on, Hanford in the 70s, that really helped kind of springboard us and put us on the map uh, globally. And then, you know, getting more into when I was like in middle school and high school, you know, my grandmother, Billy Jane Lampson, was very instrumental in um, working with other community leaders to start the Tri Cities Cancer Center. Uh, we had a hand in helping construct that building. Uh, so I'd say that those were some of the most notable ones in the past. And then most recently, uh, the Duper Tail Bridge, people would be familiar with out near the Bypass Highway. Um, and then we do some heavy hauls too for the VIT plant. Uh, we've done quite a few of those in the past. I've actually participated in some of those for vessel moves and ring beam moves and a few others. So uh, we do a little bit of everything. I think that's the one thing people don't really realize how diverse our company is. They they hear Lamson, they think cranes, but they don't realize that we have the engineering services, the rigging services, um, that we you know have a full engineering staff on site here, and that we have the heavy haul component of it as well. Yeah, I I I, I kind of conflated a couple of different questions in that one, but um, you know on the the. Uh, you know, the investment really that, that your company and your family's made in the, the community. Um, can you talk about maybe some of the local, I, I talked about you being on our board, third generation, which is awesome. Um, but Kate, what are some other, you know, local community groups or boards that you serve on around? And, and our, there, there is a question from the audience about what kinds of foundations do you support? Do you guys, you know, ally with any specific nonprofits that, um, that you guys are really involved in? So that's an excellent question. Um, we try, our philosophy is we try a, and give a little bit to everyone. Every request that comes into me, I sit down and I talk to Bill about it. It's everything from our school systems to our churches, to our nonprofit organizations, uh, working with the Humane Society, the United Way, Boys and Girls Club. We're always looking at where we can do the most good. And part of that philosophy goes very, to the very beginning of the early stages of our company where my grandparents came from very humble beginnings, they didn't have, they had a lot of help from a lot of good people, but without those people and the support of this community, we would not be where we are today. So our philosophy is to give back when we can, wherever we can and help everybody out. Yeah. I, you know, with, with uh, you being third generation and, and, like you talked about your parents, grandparents, excuse me, you know, started here really, you know, we're both uh, grew up locally and then have had that commitment to the community. What do you see as some of the changes or challenges that we're facing here in the Tri-Cities? You know, I think I've just been here a year and a half um, and have been learning a lot, but I think we're having such rapid growth and, and you know, within your families um, and businesses history, I don't know if you guys have seen that kind of growth before, but any any areas that you see coming up that um, 
that you think that we should be focusing on or or there might be real opportunities or real challenges as we move forward from a community aspect? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's wonderful. We've seen a lot of expansion here over the years in the Tri-Cities, especially with the agriculture industry and the wine industry, um, obviously with our beautiful Columbia River here. We're a very economical place to live. Um, we have affordable housing here and we have great school systems. So I think we're very desirable and we're going to continue to see people moving into the Tri-City area. Uh, I think with that, you know, comes a lot of responsibility to help take care of everyone in our community, especially with what we've, you know, all experienced this last year. So I think, you know, helping out the nonprofits as much as we can, helping support our small businesses, um, helping our schools and uh, keeping them open and running. Um, I, but I just really feel like, again, that spirit of coming together to take care of one another in whatever way you can do that. If you notice, you know, um, an individual that needs help or an animal that needs taking care of, be that good person to just step up to the plate and ask if someone needs help or pick up that animal and take them in to get checked out. Um, just really being good people and taking care of one another. That's a such a good point. I, I'm struck by that, that, you know, we are 300,000 people now, but the, the, um, what I've experienced is like, we still have, I'd call it like that small town feel, you know, I mean, I, I think there is still a connection between so many different people within our community on, you know, throughout a range of, of so many different measures. And, um, you know, earlier this year, uh, we were part of uh, what was called the tri-party agreement. So it was Energy Northwest, X-Energy on their advanced reactor, uh, you know, that they're planning to potentially build uh, out at the Energy Northwest site and then Grant County PUD. And uh, Kevin Nort was down from Grant County PUD and he had a couple of his commissioners, which, which you know, we all know our local utility district commissioners or, or county commissioners and they represent our community. And, and after the meeting, you know, one of the, uh, their commissioners said, he goes, you know, I haven't really spent a lot of time down here, but you guys, I like how you do business. You know, you're, you're pretty straight up. You have good conversations. You're pretty casual about it and, and you're really good to deal with. And I said, it's, you know, it's cause we're all still really from, from small towns and, and the Tri-City still has that, that small town feel. Is that, is that, do you, do you feel that? I mean, like when you're in Australia and, you know, Japan and these different places, like it, do, you, do you think we still have that, that feel in doing business here? I do 100%. Honestly, I've known people have moved from all parts of the US and different parts of the world. And the one thing they do say is how community minded we are, how we really support one another, how easy it is to get around this area. Um, and just, you know, that feeling of helping each other out. And when I travel, I enjoy it um, for work. And if I'm fortunate enough to get to go on vacation every now and again, uh, I enjoy that too, but I love being home. I like coming home. This is home for me. As my grandparents said, you know, this is, why would you want to be anywhere else? Exactly right. And I did just get uh, uh, input from my team. I referred incorrectly to the agreement. It was the Tri-Energy Partnership. So I wanted to make sure I, I pointed that out. I might've made an incorrect reference and I appreciate, we've got a great team here at Tri-Deck too. <laughs> They're yes, all watching know. my back. So <laughs> exactly. Um, I, Kate, I think you serve, I, I know in some capacity with Association of Western Business. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, you know, some of the challenges that we're seeing in Washington and some of the issues that AWB is working on, um, you know, that affect all of our businesses here in Washington and, and some of those initiatives that, that maybe folks that are joining us today could learn more about and maybe even participate in? Sure. So I have uh, been serving with the AWB now going on about two and a half, two, two and a half years and was involved with them long before that. Our company's been a member of AWB for over 50 years and have a great working relationship with them. Um, I would say they did a fantastic job of, of pivoting this year. Their staff has done an amazing job, but they really a lot of their members that were manufacturers pivoted and helped make PPE to help businesses going during the pandemic. So I feel it not only are they great in that regard, but they're going to bat for small business all the time, especially in Olympia and especially with this, you know, last legislative session. So they are there as a great resource. I think it's awb.org. You can check them out and see all the different departments and ways that they can help your small business. That's perfect. And have you guys, I, 
I, I'm not sure, um, but I would assume that you guys have participated and they do a manufacturing tour uh, every year. I'm sure you guys have been a, a steady stop on that manufacturing tour. We have participated in that in the past when the bus rolls up. Uh, we've been out there and, and visiting with the staff and talking to, to Chris Johnson and his crew. Um, we were actually nominated, um, you know, at one point for manufacturing excellence. So uh, very excited about the things that they're doing there uh, at the AWB and, and really happy to be a part of that. That's awesome. That, um, I think in the, the video, there was a reference about United Way and you guys talked about United Way and Boys and Girls Clubs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Some of the, are there any programs that they're uh, working on that you guys have partnered with, uh, you know, for those nonprofits locally? So that's a great question. We have always been supporters of the United Way for as long as I can remember. And uh, we run a campaign within our organization every year whereby we give our uh, employees the opportunity uh, to give back, you know, through through donation and through some, some giving. Um, and so what I love about the United Way is I do many organizations is they they work with so many different uh, organizations and nonprofits throughout the community to help in various capacities. So I would say that's one that our employees are very involved in. We've been big supporters of the Boys and Girls Club as well, which I think has been very important this, this past year to really provide a place for children to go, a safe place to go for learning and interaction and growing. Yeah, that's, that's great organizations that do such great things in our community for sure. Um, we're down to about, you know, maybe five minutes or something. I, I want to ask a question about your grandfather. Um, and it didn't talk about it in the little, little bit in the uh, video, but, uh, can you tell us a little about what he did in world war II? I, I just think it's such a cool story. And, and I know being in your office, uh, you know, still have some, some, uh, planes and references, but I think there might be a picture behind you, but can you talk a little bit about maybe your, your grandfather's, uh, service to our country in world war II? Sure, yeah, so he served as a, a ferry pilot instructor and um, was gone, uh, you know, for the formative years, uh, several years when my aunties were growing up. Uh, behind me, you can kind of see some pictures um, of him and, um, and his troop. And, and when he passed, my mother actually put all of these together. And the one right above me actually has his bomber jacket and scarf, his goggles and uh, a pack of cigars that he used to carry. So um, I can't really show you right now, but there's also replicas of every plane that he, he flew during that time here in his office. And there's about a dozen of them uh, sitting up on this, this large bookshelf here. It's really cool. I think, um, you, know, the, the, you know, providing that role and probably the traveling that he did, I, I can't even ima imagine, you know, because we, we did so many programs where we would uh, probably some of the planes he was ferrying went to other companies like, you know, at that time that were our allies like the Soviet Union and, and uh, you know, England and ones like that. I mean, he probably had a chance to travel internationally and see that. And, and it's, I think it's cool how he just took that, uh, the learning that he did probably at a really young age, brought it right back here to the Tri-Cities and then kind of built Lampson International on those same, same principles, right? Like that, that global approach to it, which was really obviously a, uh, uh, huge influence from from world war ii like out on your grandfather probably he did and that you know growing up in those times and having that experience really is part of what formulated our company in the way it is today and, and keeping it lean and having good people working with you uh and i will say too he was gone while they were starting the family business my grandmother was helping run the business out of the home and she was renting space uh, to army wives to help put food oh, wow. on the table for, for my aunties uh, and the family. So, you know, it goes all the way back. That philosophy really does go back to the way that they were raised. And of course, his time in, in service. Uh, and I thank you for bringing that up because obviously it's not just your grandfather, but it's clear that your grandmother and grandfather had this partnership, right? That wasn't just their relationship, but it was also their approach to business. And, and your grandmother was such a critical part of for building and running the business starting out even when he was gone and, and over the years that I, you know, I think it's awesome that, that you, and I know your, your aunts have also, you know, taken forward, um, you know, and been such a huge part of their business. And I think it speaks so, so much about your company, about your family too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how about one more question and then I'll give you a, like a closing uh, remark, but 
what are some of the things that your guys are working on? Like what's, what's the next step for Lampson International? New, new products or services or anything you guys got that you're cooking up that, uh, that'll be coming up in the future? Right now, we're standing strong with our manufacturing. Uh, we have a lot of new customers coming in. They want fixtures or spreader bars manufactured or maybe refurbished for them. I think we're going to definitely continue with our 4100 uh, for the Millennium Series, and we're getting into the 4600 and remanufacturing that. Those both have a ring attachment and a tower attachment, which just gives you a, a different type of um, reach and maneuverability. And so... I think we're, for now, going to remain strong with what we're doing, and uh, we don't have any real plans for expansion, especially with the way this last year has been with uncertainty, um, but we're feeling good, we're feeling strong, and we're just going to keep on going. So awesome. I, you know, Kate, thanks, thanks for taking an hour, and I, I hope that, that you had as good a time as I had, you know, and, and just a casual conversation over a cup of coffee, but you know, thank you for your time and, and to your family and your family's business for your investment and dedication to the Tri-Cities. I mean, you guys have been a key part of all the history that's happened since World War II, for sure. And I really appreciate you taking some time to come on and join us today and tell a little bit about that legacy and about you yourself. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It truly has been an honor and a pleasure. And to be able to represent the family business and the family today, I really thank you for having me on, Carl. Yeah, you, you did a great job and we'll make sure that we have you back. And of course, this is part of our, our Built in the Tri series. We want to really highlight uh, the manufacturing and the, the companies that we have. And you guys are, you know, it's, it's great to have you as one of our first guests on that, that part of the series because you guys have been such a, a huge part of the Tri Cities, our economy, and, and uh, you know, especially here with us at TriDeck. So thanks again for your time today. Thanks everybody for joining us and have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay. 